making sense of relevant topics and news, uh, which is a program of Sawasawa Network. My name is Roger Alfred Leron Modi. I'm the producer and the host. And today we shall be looking at uh, the issue of the flooding uh, that has been ongoing uh, in Jungle Estate. And uh, we are joined by uh, an activist and uh, the founder of uh, Nonviolent Youth Initiative, uh, Jacob Alwong. Uh, he is, ju is just from um, uh, Bor, Jungle Estate. He is joining us via Zoom from Juba. Welcome to the show, uh, Jacob Alwong. Thank you so much, uh, Roger Alfred, for uh, hosting me today. Yeah, give yeah, given that you are just coming from uh, the ground, um, you can give our audience, you know, a picture of what is happening uh, there uh, as a result of uh, the flooding. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, 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 Roger Alfred. Uh, I've been moving between uh, Bor uh, since this flooding started. Uh, uh, so I've been moving up there and I have a small team uh, of, uh, of non-violent youth volunteers that I have set up to help the most vulnerable people. So I traveled there on Saturday to meet them and to encourage them on what they are doing and also to help them distribute some items to the most affected areas, uh, affected people. So the flood in Jongule started earlier between uh, June and July and it has devastated the, uh, the whole of Jongule state. And you go to people, which is the people administrative where people are crying. If you go to the northern counties in Jongule state like Wural, Old Pangak, people are really, really affected and people are leaving the area. And if you come to the southern state of Bor, Duke and Twitch East, uh, you really find that it has, it has devastated the area. Some counties are completely deserted. Uh, counties, for example, uh, uh, like Twitch East uh, is completely deserted, except few people who are still uh, camping in the headquarters of Twitch East County in Panyagor. They are uh, camping uh, in, in church premises and in schools that are, uh, are still not affected. You know, they have surrounded themselves with dikes and when you come to Bor also, the same thing, the five payams in Bor County have uh, actually uh, been affected. And uh, as we speak, yeah, water level is, is, is reducing. And yeah, some people are coming back a little bit, but the level of water there is still very high uh, in those counties. And yeah, you can travel for hours between Bor and Twitch, and you just use the main road uh, as the, uh, as the uh, guide to take you to Twitch East County. You know, we don't use vehicle and vehicles anymore or the main Nile for someone to go to to, uh, to, to Twitch and to you just use the main highway using uh, the light boats to take you there. And that describes uh, how uh, the level of water there is very extreme this season. And, uh, and um, what, what, what are other challenges that uh, have arisen uh, uh, challenge that came up uh, as a result of, uh, of, of the situation of the flooding uh, also you can be saying uh, uh, giving us uh, those challenges uh, by also contrasting you know with the level of uh, response uh, to the situation that uh, are ongoing whether by government or other other humanitarian organizations yeah, there are a lot of uh, challenges, Rogers, Alfred, uh, you know, starting uh, back then in, uh, in June, you know, the, the, the level of response and coordination did not happen really to the expectation since uh, the government and the opposition group were, sto uh, were stalled to form the government on time. So that gap uh, had actually created uh, a lot of challenges, you know, the coordination of humanitarian activities was not coordinated well, and uh, that has led to, uh, you know, to the movement of people randomly, you know, some decided to come to Mangala where uh, there are no humanitarian agencies or even the government or the, or the police protection. Uh, until recently, the governor of Jongole State just landed in Bor uh, three days ago for, for, first, for second time. The first one was just one day, but now he just went there and uh, think that will also improve the coordination of humanitarian crisis. But <clears throat> the lack of government in place was the main uh, challenge. I think that that brought a lot of suffering. Uh, as I can uh, can tell you now, the governor the governor is back and he will be 
coordinating all the. Uh, excuse me, I'm need some water. With, uh, that will be fine. My throat was very dry, so mm -hmm. that was the main challenge. But uh, he's now back mm -hmm. uh, to the state, and he will take a full responsibility as the chief of the area, as the chief of uh, uh, the entire jungle state. So that was the main challenge. Second to that, people have been affected by hunger. You know, farms have been completely destroyed. So people will not expect any harvest. This, is, this, is, this was supposed to be harvest season, but farms are entirely destroyed by the flood. So people are likely uh, to starve maybe in the, uh, in, in the next few months. And as you know, people of uh, Jongule are agri-pastoralists. Agri they, they cultivate and they also keep cattle. You know, kettles have been driven out of the state as we speak. Most of them have come to to Central Equatoria and Eastern Equatoria and others have crossed uh, to Eastern uh, to Lake State, the, east, the eastern part of, east, of Lake State. And that has also excavated the level of uh, malnutrition among children who used to defend, uh, uh, depend on milk. And they are now struggling to, 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 to survive. And the level of malnutrition is really cropping up uh, among those vulnerable groups. And it has also cut people out from accessing uh, accessing medical uh, facilities and and the market itself. So you find market is running out of of supplies and the few uh, goods that are in the market are very expensive. As hundreds of thousands of people are fighting over those few items. And yeah, those are the few challenges that I can I can say right now. But also on those who have migrated to. To the neighboring states, you know, I am worried about the ongoing tension between the host communities and the cattle uh, keeping communities, as a lot of kettles have arrived in eastern and uh, central Equatoria this year. That is not healthy for, I mean, for for our coexistence. You know, they used to come in smaller numbers, but this time they are completely completely swept out, and they will be disturbing uh, the host communities, and that is worrisome. And I can also count that as one of the challenges that has come uh, with the floods uh, this year. Uh, also, given that you, where well, I saw in the pictures that you shared uh, uh, on social media, you, you've been close to those who are affected. You, you managed to hear from them and talk to them. Uh, what, what, what are they saying? Uh, are they feeling abandoned? Are they feeling uh, that uh, what is being done to them is enough in terms of uh, rescuing them? Or what are their views about the response? Uh, yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you uh, Roger Alfred. Uh, you know, that is true. They feel like they are, have been abandoned. And mainly those who are, are still behind are those who who feel like they have nowhere to go. And uh, they just say feel like they should hold on and see what will happen next, but they have been affected. They thought humanitarian agencies and the government would even uh, go there and help them with necessary needs, but that is not happening a lot. Uh, I, I have talked to a few people and I think uh, last month, <clears throat> some of them have started to receive, receive uh, non-food items, things like blanket and cooking pots. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a, a light you know, on, on the other side of the tunnel to some people I have talked to, but they, they are still uh, looking for more uh, as uh, the main issue now is hunger. You know, they do not come with a lot of food stuff in their granaries in their villages, but they came only with children. You know, they could not carry a lot of food. So they are running out of food, but they have received, received so far few supplies and they are so uh, uh, appreciative, but they, they are still... Uh, you know, asking the government and the humanitarian agencies to look into uh, into the matter. And yes, as you have said about the picture that I shared on my uh, on my Facebook page, I was on my way to to the main market to see uh, the level of uh, <clears throat> destruction. And then I came came across. I bumped into these two gentlemen who were carrying uh, a, a, a woman who was in labor, a, a woman who had actually delivered one and, and one child was remaining in the stomach and the, there was no vehicle or any tractor or, or a boat uh, for them to, to, to carry her to the hospital. So they had to wrap her in a blanket. They tie 
uh, the blanket uh, on both ends and then they put a lock in the middle and for them to carry the woman when she was when, the, when another child was still stuck uh, in the stomach and that devastated me and uh, and that made me to post it on social media for people to see the level of devastation in the state and the effect uh, uh, that has uh, you know that is now impacting people in the state and yes that is that is that is it you know people are completely cut off those did you manage to follow that story or you, you uh, were they able to get uh, the uh, you know, medical attention they were seeking? Yes, yes. Yes, I followed them right away. I went there and then she was received at the uh, board teaching hospital and, and she was taken to the theatre immediately and she was uh, operated. They call it C-section. Then they removed uh, the second child. Uh, and all of them are, are alive. Uh, you know, one child was alleged to have passed away, but uh, when I went and, and went to their relatives, they said, oh, that was a misinformation. The first child is alive and the second one is also alive. So I was there, I hung around, I talked to the father, I talked to the uncles and close relatives, and one of the surgeons who was taking care of her, uh, she said, you know, it was because of the flood, you know, people could not bring her on time. And they thought she was just going to deliver at home normally without carrying them on their shoulders. So, yes, she's, she's okay. I went in the evening yesterday to the hospital. She's, she's, she's recovering well. And the twins are also doing well. And I called the husband this morning also before I boarded the plane. And he said they are doing well. And, yes, so that is what happened. And I have been following the following that story up and I have their contacts and I will continue to monitor uh, their progress. So, so um, we're almost going to the end of the program. What, um, what more do you think need to be done um, in terms of the response, whether by the government and uh, humanitarian organizations? Uh, uh, to help the situation, what, what, what more should they, what other things that they should do more? Uh, as we speak, yeah, people are still desperate. So I would like the government to step up the response. Since we have the governor now in the state, he needs to take over the, I mean, a full responsibility as the boss of the area to coordinate humanitarian uh, issues with uh, other stakeholders and also to do their part in in doing so. If they also want to help people like that woman, they need maybe to set up a mobile maybe mobile clinic at some different part of South Sudan, maybe with a tent or something like rap hall where they will be responding or will be attend attending to those cases. Um, you know, the, a lot of things are happening, or if at all, they may need to procure a plastic boat, what they call dinky boat. It's a very small boat that they can just maybe dock somewhere where the water uh, level is a bit, uh, bit, bit low, and then they can just speed up with uh, those who are affected uh, or those who are sick, those who are seeking medical attention. Maybe three or four different boats that will be standing by and they need also to set up maybe a hotline and maybe put on radio for, for people to familiarize themselves with it. If In case if someone is uh, falls sick, maybe in, 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 uh, in the residential areas, they can easily uh, contact the hospital or the authorities to, to rush in with the speed boats. And uh, yeah, so that, they, they, so that the situation I saw does not repeat itself again. Uh, Roger, that was not the, uh, the only case. You know, when I came to the hospital, I talked to some doctors and I said, how often do you see a situation like this? But some of them said, yes, you know, it does happen a lot. Uh, not only to those who are alive, but also to those who are dead. You know, when someone died, maybe in the hospital, for them to take that body to the burial uh, place or to their own homes or to the final resting place, you know, you find people carrying the dead person on, on, on the shoulders again. They used to have small canoes, but those canoes have been banned uh, these days from, from accessing those areas because they come and spoil the dike. You know, they have built some dikes to control uh, the water from uh, going to the dry area. So when they were using canoes, they used to knock down those dikes. And I heard that was the reason that they banned the canoes. But uh, now things are getting worse. They were the only ambulance they had. But since they banned them, people, are, people continue to carry uh, their 
uh, their loved ones who have passed away in the hospital on their bodies, they just carry them and then take them to their final resting place. And also they do the same thing when someone falls sick on the other side of the town on their bodies, like the photo of the woman I show you. So those are the few things that I can maybe tell the government to do, set up a mobile clinic, maybe at the outskirts of, of town to attend to those people and establish a hotline for them to pick people up and also procure uh, a speedboat uh, to ferry those complicated uh, cases from those three point or four point to the main hospital. So that's what I can say, Rogers, and maybe speed up uh, humanitarian uh, assistance if they can maybe bring in food as those people have no enough uh, stock in, in the houses and as also prices are also soaring. So I would like to mention those few, but there are a lot of things that both the government and, 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 and humanitarian agencies can do. Uh, well, thank you. Those are very valuable information. We hope uh, the concerned authorities will take action. Uh, now, uh, finally, uh, in case you have something to add, you can add, but uh, uh, my last question to you is, uh, uh, you mentioned earlier the issue of uh, uh, cattle keepers uh, who have moved out to other places in a bigger number than before, in, uh, in, big, in big numbers uh, compared to the past years, uh, given the situation uh, that uh, is ongoing there in, uh, in Jumbure. Uh, how best do you think uh, there could be ways, you know, yes, you're an activist, uh, like your, 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 your views on how they, they could find a way to coexist with the communities that now they are with, with uh, in the other states, uh, given that sometimes there, there is no approach that is uh, 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 found to be, you know, agreed upon by, by, by all together, but you find sometimes the uh, specific approaches that sometimes don't, uh, f don't bring the people together, do don't find way to, do, do not make ways for people to live you know, in peaceful coexistence. So what are your ideas in, in making sure that they, they, they live well? Thank you again, uh, Roger Alfred. Uh, uh, you know, this is a big issue. This is a crisis. This is a national disaster. And uh, yes, I expect, you know, uh, all the communities, especially the, the coming communities, community from Jongle, to also uh, stay like guests, you know, and you are a guest or a visitor in someone's house, you also uh, recognize the needs of the owner of the house. And also to the host, you also need to recognize also the needs of, 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 of the visitor. And then you keep communication, you know, between uh, uh, the two communities. They need to talk. They need to understand that they all have needs and they all need each other as people of South Sudan. Uh, cattle keepers should not allow the kettles to encroach to the farms because those communities will depend on, on, on those farms uh, for their livelihoods. And also these people from Jongole uh, wants to survive also. If they, you know, they run away from flooding, and you know when it is flooded, it floods until it covers all the grass in the you know in the bush. The kettles cannot feed and find food again, so they can easily starve. But now they have been welcomed. They are being hosted by the brothers in the eastern and and uh, central equatorial states. I would like uh, you know the the leaders on on both communities to find common ground where they can always interact and maybe maybe agree on some issues. You know, should a cow maybe cross into someone's farm? They need to find out how to deal with that. Can maybe they will maybe levy some fines on those who have failed to look after their kettles, and maybe maybe fine, maybe create certain zones where kettle will be kept far away from uh, from the farms. I know some areas where the kettles are, are you know are mostly uh, very far away from uh, from main towns like Juba, but they are very close to some villages. So if villages, uh, you know. Uh, the host community may just come up and help the kettle keepers and tell them, you know, like if you move east of or, or maybe north of Kajukeji, you may find some empty places where they can keep their kettle without keeping them closer to the farm. That will also be helpful if they can just share that information. And also to the host community, the leaders there need to come up and tell them that we are here temporarily and they run away because of the flooding. 
and then when water recedes back, they will be very happy to go back to you. I mean, I mean, uh, to the estates with that. So if they keep that information, the I, I mean, the idea, the sharing, you know, they can easily coexist, you know. But conflict comes sometimes when, yeah, you think okay, someone hit you, and then maybe some you also cut yourself to your own house. Think your area has been invaded, and maybe someone may not leave, and you know, those are all assumptions on both sides. But if there is communication flowing between the the two sides, you know they can easily stay. You know, I I really know from now up to this to maybe the end of November, I think water will recede back to the Nile, and those areas will be very beautiful again for people to return. And if that one that commitment is shared across the board, you know, maybe with the government, with the chiefs and the local authorities in these three. I states. Uh, I believe Rogers. They can even live up to the time that they will return, and that is what I can share right now. Let them open up and talk to themselves, um, or also to among themselves. Uh, as an activist, actually, as, as activist, uh, there is the fair the, the, that fairness and uh, uh, they need to convey credible information. But you see, our communities are vulnerable uh, due to uh, the lack of reliable information sometimes and uh, you find propaganda uh, people with political uh, you know interests sometimes confuse the situation and you find uh, the people end up in, in problems when uh, when it is politicians who politicize such a situation for, for, for other so th there is that need for reliable information for those people on the ground to get information so um, I don't know how, how you look at that as an activist because uh, uh, with the fact that people are vulnerable, they don't have information. Sometimes politicians are using the power of money, then you find the, the people on the ground are now having different conversations that, than the situation that actually exists. So yeah. I really agree. I really agree with you. You know, uh, our situation usually escalates because of misinformation and propaganda and unwillingness of the leaders. You know, our own leaders sometimes to act swiftly to uh, to de-escalate the situation. I have witnessed that and have also talked in uh, uh, some forums here trying to de-escalate uh, those propaganda. But yeah, it will be up to us. We cannot continue to be enemies of ourselves when we know some facts remain on ground. And if they are shared, you know, wisely and clearly, we can prevent violence in one way or the other. And as on my side, I will continue to talk. I usually reach out to some youth on, on both sides, the, from those youth from the cattle keeping community and, and the host community. Sometimes when they propagate and, you know, they know me on both sides, sometimes you find the host, the youth community from the host community forwarding some information to me. Like some few time back, it was uh, propagated that, uh, you know, some generals are loading cows and, you know, they're bringing them. You know, when, when flood started in, in early June, they, there was that propaganda online that there were some generals who were, uh, you know, loading cows on trucks and on boats, you know, to come to uh, this part of uh, central Equatoria. But I was also approached by someone. I told, usually tell them, trust me, uh, whatever I can tell you, just trust it. And I cannot trust those who are keeping cattle, yes, or those who have their farms. But if I, I, I try to be fair and honest in, in my life. So if there is any information like that, I would, I would have informed you guys that this is true, but this is not true. Uh, general, some generals from those areas may have kettles, but they don't even keep kettles. They don't even decide where kettles should be moved. They only roam around with those youth who want to keep kettles. So there was nothing like that. And I have tried to, to share that valid information. And I think it is working at some point, but I usually go through youth. You know, our politicians don't disregard us sometimes, or they try to exclude us from uh, certain activities. But yes, as uh, as young people, we, I, I do my part sometimes. I reach my counterpart on the other side and I also talk to this side to just tell them the facts. You know, facts are always facts and they, are, they can help us and they can harm us if they are misrepresented. And I think on my side, I will continue to uh, fill that gap on my own way, on social media or physically meeting uh, 
the youth of, 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 of on different sides, and that is true. That that that, that should be our work, and we must pick it up. Uh, whether we are activists, whether we are advocates, we must reach out to our MPs, to our presidents, uh, our president also, and and uh, and different leaders and the chief. They need to be engaged. You know, president may not know what is happening on ground, but chief may know it better. But if they don't coordinate it, if they come and tell polls and maybe share uh, misinformation it can easily, easily escalate. So we need to feed ourselves as a group, starting from the chief, the youth, and the government officials, MPs, including the presidency, for us to find uh, facts and for us to make informed decisions that can last forever and to also restore peace in our country. That's what I can say. Well, uh, Jacob Olong, uh, your video has frozen, but uh, there is no problem. We have, we have, we have all already finished the program so uh, the message is already here with us so there is no problem so thank you very much for being on the show uh, we will always continue to find ways to uh, uh, move things uh, in the right direction in the country and uh, achieve uh, peace uh, thank you once again much Roger Fred and thanks for hosting me we will meet again thank you okay, bye.